From the Watson Institute at Brown University, this is Trending Globally. I'm Sarah Baldwin. On March 2nd, 2020, Watson Fellow and Pulitzer Prize winning author David Kurtzer met with some colleagues at the Vatican. That in itself wasn't too unusual. David is, after all, one of the world's leading experts on the modern history of the Catholic Church. What was unusual was the circumstance. David was there to explore the Vatican Apostolic Archives, formerly known as the Vatican's Secret Archives. This past March, for the first time ever, the Church opened the archives to independent researchers. David used the opportunity to explore the records of Pope Pius XII, who led the Church during World War II. In August, David published a piece in The Atlantic based on his research about the Vatican's behavior in the face of rising German power during World War II. It was groundbreaking, beautifully written, and utterly disturbing. Many in the Vatican's orbit were not happy with what David found. The semi-official newspaper of the Vatican decided to dedicate an entire page following the publication of my piece in The Atlantic to denouncing it. On this episode, I talked with David about what he uncovered and what it can teach us about the role one of the most powerful institutions in history played in World War II. We also talk about the bigger questions his piece raises, questions about the responsibility of institutions in the face of violence, hate, and persecution. Given the controversial work David produced from his research, I started by asking, why did the Vatican open up these archives in the first place? As David described, it was a long time coming. Well, there'd been pressure on the Vatican for probably half a century, in fact, to open the archives, especially the World War II archives of the papacy of the controversial Pope Pius XII. Pope Francis announced uh, now about a year and a half ago that he would be finally opening them beginning in March of 2020. So I, along with a handful of other very excited historians from uh, various parts of the world, uh, were there March 2nd, the morning they opened the archives. And uh, the controversy and the excitement really was uh, in part around the issue of the role played by the Pope in the Vatican in World War II in general, and in particular with respect to the Holocaust. And uh, there's been a movement at the very height of the Vatican to address this history. That said, still today, the official position of the Vatican, as uh, stated in their uh, statement, official statement from the late 90s, we remember, is that uh, the modern anti-Semitism had no relationship to anything, any anti-Jewish uh, thrust of the church that it was something identified with modern times, with secularism, and had nothing to do with Christianity. While some of the national churches, including most recently the German uh, branch of the Roman Catholic Church, uh, has admitted that, in fact, there is some and an important relationship between the two, uh, the Vatican still uh, has not. And so in that sense, uh, the current Pope, Pope Francis, has not changed uh, what I think really needs to be changed coming in coming to terms with this history. Well, why is it important for us to understand the Pope's and the Church's roles in the Holocaust and in World War II? The question that is, is I think, most important is the one of how, in the middle of Europe, in the middle of the 20th century, uh, among a people that was thought to be a particularly sophisticated, uh, namely the German people, there could have been undertaken and accomplished the mass murder of the Jewish population of Europe. And the role played by Christianity in demonizing the Jews has been one of the major issues of used to try to explain how people could have been willing to kill little babies and old people and others. So the question of what role the Vatican played, the Roman Catholic Church, is just part of this larger issue of Christianity and the Holocaust has become a major issue. Pius XII is seen by many conservatives in the church as a heroic figure in part because he was the last pre-Second Vatican Council a pope, and many of the conservatives in the church see the Second Vatican Council as where the church went wrong, left its traditional teachings, and tried to make peace with modern times. Uh, so you know, this is part of the the heat behind the polemics around the Pope Pius XII and his relationship with Jews. Well, yeah, and, and you describe in this article um, mainstream Italian media got in on the act of, of sort of portraying 
Pius the Twelfth in a favorable light. Yes, you have to also understand it's not just the church that's reinterpreting its history. You might say whitewashing its history in terms of its relationship with the fascist regimes, the totalitarian regimes that would eventually lead to World War II and the Holocaust. Italy itself, I mean, I've spent many years of my life living in Italy, and one gets the impression there that Italy fought on the side of the Allies during World War II, not that it was uh, fought with Hitler. Um, so the church in trying to remake its history is, is certainly not alone. Um, one sees this not only in Italy, but other parts of Europe that uh, was, in fact, complicit with the, uh, the uh, fascist period and with eventually with uh, World War II. Can we stay in the archives for a moment? Can you describe what it was like to, to walk in and begin to work there? What, what's the room like? Is it rooms? Yeah, it's curious. The Vatican Secret Archive, or what had been until recently called the Secret Archive, has become a uh, kind of place of great uh, mystery. Uh, Dan Brown wrote about it dramatically, and uh, recently Daniel Silva, another kind of best-selling thriller writer, uh, features it in his book that was just out this year. It's a place where I've, I've worked for many years on, on other projects before this opening. So it's the same place as before. It's just this new material that's available there that hadn't been available before. Once you get permission to use it, you have to schedule. They only allow, even before COVID, a limited number of people per day in. So you have to reserve a place. And it's a, uh, you know, hundreds of years old uh, building. It's got frescoed uh, walls and ceilings in various parts. So it's it's quite a sensation working there. So it sounds more like a beautiful historic space rather than like a musty basement. Yes, exactly. Of course, when you're there, you're working alongside people who work on very different topics from some of them for periods a thousand years ago, because the documents cover over a thousand years of church history. So I, you might be next to a you know a Polish monk who's working on the history of the Polish church in the 18th century, this kind of thing. Before you tell us what you found, could you just sort of set the, the stage for us? Describe the Jewish population in Italy and Mussolini's racial laws and, and you know, was it a big part of the population? Was it, was it small? Was it, were relations friendly? Yeah, the, um, the relative size of the Jewish population of, of various countries in Europe uh, varied tremendously. In Germany itself, it was about 1% of the population. In Italy, it was only one-tenth of 1% 1 of the population. So it was about 40,000 or so uh, Jews lived in Italy in the late 30s and, and early 40s. For much of the Italian population, when in 1938, Mussolini introduced what were called the racial laws, the anti-Semitic laws that threw all Jewish students out of the schools, uh, fired all Jewish teachers, all Jewish civil servants, and so on. Uh, this came as something of a surprise, partly because there were so few Jews in Italy. But these were rather draconian laws, and they were justified by the fascist regime, in part by reference to this is what the popes had always done when the popes had power over Jews, as they did in the papal states for centuries until... Uh, the fall of Papal Rome in 1870. Those racial laws, if I've understood it, are important in the future. But first, we I think we need to talk about what you what you did discover. So what were your two main discoveries when you um, were granted access to the archives? I was looking for looking at what was the most controversial aspect of the Pope's actions during the Holocaust, especially from an Italian point of view, namely on October 16th, 1943. The uh, Nazis who were occupying Rome at the time uh, tried to round up as many Jews as they could from Rome and rounded up over a thousand of them. This took many hours and all of Rome watched on in horror as this was happening. The Jews were then put in a holding facility right literally next to the Vatican and kept there for two days. The Pope never publicly protested the roundup of the Jews. He knew what was going to happen to them. Uh, and two days later, they are placed in a series of trucks and taken to the train station. And from there, a train bound for Auschwitz, where almost all would be murdered. And that was mostly women and children and older people? Yes. I mean, curiously, um, at the time, the Jews somehow thought, or most Jews thought, that it was uh, men, and particularly young men, at, at most risk of being rounded up. They couldn't quite conceive of the roundup of one-month-old babies and 95-year-old uh, women and so on. And so when the uh, Gestapo came to the homes of that identified as Jewish homes in Rome, 
for the most part, the men were absent. And so uh, of the over a thousand people taken, the great majority were uh, women, children, and older men. The, uh, the fact that the Pope did not protest this uh, happening right, as it said, under his window has led to a lot of uh, polemics, a lot of discussion. What I discovered in the newly opened archives was a series of memos from one of his top advisors suggesting that some protests be made, and then a memo from another top advisor, a man who later becomes Cardinal Vicar of Rome, saying, no, they shouldn't protest, and uh, the various reasons that we could discuss for why the, they thought the Pope shouldn't uh, lodge a protest. Uh, but both memos, both the one saying, suggesting he should protest and the one suggesting he shouldn't, were loaded with anti-Semitic uh, stereotypes and language. The argument of the person who said uh, they should protest was that the racial laws were already keeping the Jews under uh, control and were a great thing. Uh, so why do you need to now round them up and massacre them? And so you found these documents. How much of a, of a surprise was it to confirm that, in fact, you didn't discover soul searching by the Pope or the Pope actually wanting to protest this? Did it confirm something for you or did it surprise you? No, I would say it's more confirmatory because the one thing we did know uh, from a document that had been published by the Vatican previously as part of an earlier effort to publish a, a series of, of documents dealing with World War II was that the Secretary of State, who's really the number two under the Pope, who meets every morning with the Pope, as the uh, Jews were being rounded up, or just as they were being rounded up that day, called on the German ambassador to the Holy See and met with him. And we have the Secretary of State, the Cardinal Secretary of State's account of that meeting with the German ambassador, where he said, this is, you know, terrible. Uh, this has really upset the Pope and, and the rest of us here that you'd be rounding up the uh, Jews in in Rome, do you really need to do this? And the ambassador says, well, uh, do you really want me to let Berlin know that you're protesting this? Because this was ordered by the very highest authority in, in Berlin, namely, of course, Hitler. And to that, the Secretary of State, and this is from his own account of the meeting, says, no, I didn't say that, that, you know, I leave it to your discretion. So we knew that um, from this already, that the Pope and those around him were eager to maintain good relations with the uh, Germans. It's not that uh, the Pope was any fan of Hitler. He certainly was not. But uh, among other things, at the time, Rome was being occupied by the Germans and the uh, Pope was eager to keep cordial relations with the Germans, uh, worried that uh, the interests of the church in Rome and the Vatican City itself might be somehow threatened uh, if he angered Hitler and the Nazis. Well, isn't there also put forward the argument that he was feeling protective of Catholics in Poland. He didn't want to put them more at risk. Well, I mean, this is interesting because when we talk about the silence of the Pope, people usually think, in fact, of the Holocaust and understandably. But in reading through the archives, as I've been doing over the last month, the silence begins much earlier and has to do with Poland. You know, World War II began September 1st, 1939, when the German army uh, marches into Poland and of course, Poland is an overwhelmingly Catholic country. And so the Polish church and, and Polish Catholics were looking for the Pope to protest against the German invasion of Poland, which he refused to do. So uh, the Pope was getting, as we know from now, Pope was constantly uh, beginning in, in the fall of 1939, being uh, requested by Polish church sources to protest against the Nazis, which he, he would not do. I think, you know, one of the reasons that's not generally recognized for the Pope's silence, the Pope's decision he would not directly criticize the Nazis, is that he realized that uh, a large number of the Nazis were Catholic. And he was afraid that if he were to, as he would think of it, put the Catholic Nazis in a position of choosing the Nazi party or the Catholic Church, they would leave the Catholic Church or maybe even worse, create a secessionist church of uh, German Nazi Catholics, which he certainly didn't want to see. And from my point of view, this is really the major issue uh, about the silence of the Pope. It's that who was it who was murdering all these Jewish you know, little children and old people and so on? A lot of them were people who thought of themselves as good Christians and in fact had grown up with deeply anti-Semitic notions inculcated in them by the various churches. Tell us about the Finale affair. So the other... Uh, case that uh, I wrote about in the, the recent Atlantic article that's gotten a fair amount of attention is this case of these two boys, two little boys, 
who were orphans of the Holocaust, and they were part of a larger phenomenon. With millions of uh, Jews murdered during the Holocaust, they left many thousands of orphans behind. Of these, a fair number were protected by Catholic institutions like monasteries and um, convents, but also Catholic families. After the war, it turns out that many of these institutions and some of these uh, Catholic families were not eager to give these children back to whoever survived from their families. Often their parents had been murdered, but other relatives uh, survived. And really the most famous of these cases, because it got huge international attention, was the case of these two boys, Thinley boys. They were born in 1941 and 42. Their parents were living in France. The parents were deported to Auschwitz, where they were murdered in uh, February 1944. The children ended up uh, under the care of a Catholic woman. And uh, beginning just a few months later, when the Allies liberated France, so now in early 1945, uh, one of their aunts came to the door of this woman who had protected them to thank her, but also to ask for the children to be returned to their family as was the kind of dying wish of the parents. And she uh, basically, uh, after a kind of anti-Semitic rant, uh, refused to return them to a Jewish family. So this began a case that would take years through the French courts. The French courts repeatedly ordered the woman to uh, release the children to their family. Uh, she refused to do it. Eventually, by uh, 1953, a underground of uh, nuns and uh, monks spirited the child because, again, because of these court orders to have the, the children return to their family, spirited them through a series of monasteries and convents into Basque land across the, uh, the border into Spain. The uh, French courts ordered the arrest and imprisonment of both this uh, woman who had taken uh, responsibility for the children, but also a number of monks and, and nuns. They were all jailed on charges of, of basically kidnapping. And where did the boys end up? Well, they ended up in Israel. So, And they grew up Jewish after that. Yeah, they've led, uh, a, a, you might say, normal life as adults in, in Israel. So all this uh, was known at the time. What wasn't known is the role played by the Pope in the Vatican in orchestrating what would happen. And that's what I was able to discover in these recently opened archives. How long did it take you to piece together these stories from millions of pages, I imagine? And and I wonder if the pandemic, which kind of was ramping up, especially in Italy, did that limit you? Did that limit your access in this process? Yes. So after only a week of opening, so we waited for 50 years for them to, these archives be open. They were open March 2nd. And then that Friday, we were told this was the last day till further notice because of the pandemic. Fortunately, they opened up again at the beginning of June. Americans have not been, as you know, allowed to go into Italy, given our situation here with COVID. But I have a collaborator who's an uh, Italian and church historian who works with me, and we've written a number of pieces together. And he's been been able to, since they reopened, uh, work there. And so we've worked together on um, examining the uh, the archival material, these hundreds of pages that have become available. Have you gotten any pushback either from within Italy or from other scholars who don't appreciate the Catholic Church being, or Pius XII being outed in a way? Yes, I wouldn't say from scholars, but uh, there's kind of a whole industry of um, defenders of Pius XII. The Vatican newspaper, the <clears throat> semi-official uh, newspaper of the Vatican, L'Osservatore Romano, decided to dedicate an entire page following the publication of my piece in The Atlantic to denouncing it. Denouncing your article. Yes, it's entirely devoted to denouncing that article. And that's pretty unusual, actually, for uh, the Vatican newspaper to do for any article by anybody. But because my piece is based on you know hundreds of pages of the Vatican's own archives, because they can't uh, dispute really the accuracy of those, it's basically uh, changing the subject, ad hominem attack, that was uh, followed up by uh, the Catholic Defense League in the U.S. and some of their allies uh, writing a series of, again, kind of personal attacks and changing the subject attacks. So uh, anybody who impinges on this kind of heroic image of Pope Pius XII as a great uh, protector and friend of the Jews is uh, unfortunately open to this kind of attack. So I'm, I'm certainly not the first. 
So how is the legacy of anti-Semitism in the Catholic Church playing out today? There was this major change with the Second Vatican Council. And so certainly the, the main thrust of the Vatican and the Catholic Church is toward uh, understanding and uh, brotherhood, sisterhood with the uh, Jewish people. But there is among uh, a minority in the church, uh, identified really with the right wing of the church, a very different kind of view of relations with Jews that insofar as the Second Vatican Council is seen as where the church went wrong, part of where it went wrong was in its idea that Jews should be uh, regarded as uh, equally worthy of respect uh, from a religious point of view. So if you go online, you can find uh, evidence of this uh, all over the place uh, any day. And again, Pius XII tends to be a hero for this segment of the church. So uh, occasionally I'll go on Twitter and put in you know, Pius XII, and I'll normally find scores of tweets from that day, uh, many of which will refer to Pius XII as the last real pope. And that since then, the popes have been in the hands of the Jews, the Masons, and so forth. So unfortunately, there's uh, still a wing of the Roman Catholic Church that can point to this history to justify you know, negative attitudes toward Jews. Uh, fortunately, it is a minority. So more broadly, thinking about your readers, what do you hope people will take away from your work in terms of possible lessons about silence, bigotry? Well, I think it's that when you demonize the other, uh, it can lead to consequences that you actually bear responsibility for. So the demonization of the Jews, which the uh, church played a major role in, it's true. Certainly the Pope was not happy to see the massacre of uh, Europe's Jews and in fact was horrified by it. But it was made possible by many decades of vilification of Jews that people heard from the pulpit as they grew up. These are things, obviously, in today's world where various others, obviously not just Jews, are, get vilified, whether Muslims or uh, other ethnic minorities or religious minorities or, or for uh, other minority groups. The, the Holocaust is a, should be a, a lesson that caused people to think about uh, exactly what their responsibilities are. David, thank you so much for talking to us about your work today. It's been fascinating. Oh, I'm glad to do so. <laughs> Thanks. This episode was produced by Dan Richards and Alina Coleman. Our theme music is by Henry Bloomfield. I'm Sarah Baldwin. You can subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you like the show, leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps others find us. For more information about this and other shows, go to watson.brown.edu. Thanks for listening, and tune in in two weeks for another episode of Trending Globally.